Welcome! Today we're focusing on a Drac 25 Plasma Carbine, analysing each and every single overclock, looking at different builds and potentially what overclock is best. I also want to thank these players who took the time to share their builds and insights into the gun. More available on them in the description. These are the mods I've used to create this video and I want to thank the creators of them. A special mention for the Weapon Heat Crosshair mod. This has been essential in the producing of this video but also I found it invaluable to when I'm actually playing the game. That's whether I'm using the Drac 25 or any other gun with heat requirements. I highly recommend you download this mod and give it a go. We're going to start off our simulations looking at the overclocks which is more like using the base gun and this is really going to help us give us a baseline for then when we look at the more exotic and more damage dealing overclocks. Thermal liquid coolant gives us more sustained firepower and we can see this in this simulation here. We've got the extreme example of no gear mods or overclock on the far left and then on the far right we've got TLC with everything and you can see that additional firepower or effectively additional magazine size. This is our cooling simulation now and this is after 25 shots fired. Once again we've got the extreme on the far left, best case on the far right and not only does that far right start cooling the gun quicker and it's also less than half a second and we're down to zero heat. This really gives us extra firepower and sustainability. Something to note is the custom heat mod still registers heat there even though the gun we can see is down to zero. In this simulation up against 30 grunts we really need that sustainability and thermal liquid coolant on the right hand side is really gaining that. Less heat fired per shot but also we're cooling the gun quicker between those bursts. This allows us to use that sustainability to really bring down this horde as opposed to the left hand side. We haven't got an overclock but we are still using all of those heat options but it's just not as good as that thermal liquid coolant on the right hand side. Being able to hold down the trigger for longer and more often can be great, especially against say a big wave of bacteria or a whole wall of acid spitters. But how is thermal liquid cooling going to compare against our rougher overclocks? Rewiring mod can give us a huge damage potential because we're refunding that ammo. Yes, it gives us the drag of needing to overheat or have to use manual heat dump, but that damage potential over a long run or a long elite deep dive can be quite ludicrous as you keep refunding this ammo back. And manual heat dump can actually make this even better. Not only saving us more ammo, but saving us time as this simulation shows. This graph from Everton can really show the difference between whether you overheat manually or overheat automatically. Allowing to overheat automatically is on the far right this last data point is going to consume 45 ammo and we're going to get 69.9 or 70 percent of our ammo return but if we use this data point at the top here this 37 shots we're actually going to get 73.6 of our ammo returned so manual heat dump is definitely going to give us more ammo back and it's going to save us time because it's obviously quicker to use manual heat dump than to let the gun automatically overheat manual heat dump can also remove the issue of needing to wait until you've completely emptied the magazine before you get that ammo refund you can do it more on your own terms i also I also wondered how rewiring mod using the manual heat dump would work against our example against 30 grunts so I thought I'd match it up against our thermal liquid coolant example from earlier and you can really see that rewiring mod it might save us ammo but it really isn't as efficient against a horde as if we could just hold down that trigger. This overclock can quite frankly give us a ludicrous amount of ammo whether we do manual heat dump at the right time every time or even just let the gun overheat. We are going to lose a percentage of our ammo this is going to be maybe we just take down a quick weber we don't get to enough heat. I think the main question here though is the fact that rewiring mod effectively makes us use the gun in its base stats so we really need to see whether this ammo really holds up against those other overclocks. The additional damage that aggressive venting can cause with that air of effect, plus the fear, is nothing to turn your nose up against. We are gaining additional DPS, but also that ignite can then transfer to other enemies, especially with the fear which then makes them run around and potentially run into each other. This can be extremely helpful for reviving down dwarfs, or even just helping you in a pinch. The overheat reduction is notable compared to our base gun, and obviously a nice thing to have. I also tried to see if animation cancelling would make any difference, and apart from the actual position the gun is in, you can still fire on the exact same frame. This really gets interesting when we consider manual heat dump. We can get to almost the same amount of heat, but we can shed it in half the amount of time. So then I thought, well, how much damage is this going to do? Is it going to be different against targets? And we can see against this grunt that we can still kill it with manual heat dump, but we're saving that time and potentially being able to get ready to start a new aggressive venting. Running the simulation with a slasher now, we've got manual heat dump on the right hand side, and you can see that speed that manual heat dump has given us, but we can now start firing. We've reduced all of that heat. And if we advance to the conclusion, 
version of this, yes, the Glyphid Grunt on the right hand side has got a little bit more health, but it's not a huge amount of difference, especially compared to the time saving. Even at just over half heat, we still apply that Ignite. It has a reduced duration, but it could still spread and keep bouncing Ignite back onto other targets, so keep that in mind. We still apply that AoE Fear, and this can be really helpful in tight situations. And even Praetorians can be feared, but oppressors, they shall know no fear. The oppressor is not running from anything. A few last points on aggressive venting, and that's one, it's very hard to ignite a Praetorian. You can do it, but the effort is just not worth it. You're more likely to kill it with other stuff before you ignite it. Hot feet is also a really good option. I really think hot feet and manual heat dump are kind of essential with this build, allowing you to ignite and fear when you want to, and have that speed bonus to sort of kite around. In the description, there will be a link next to blindfolded name. This is actually a hazard six run that he's done using aggressive venting. If you're interested in it, I recommend you watch that clip. Bouncing projectiles for impact deflection gives is great for taking on the hordes, and you can't go too wrong with this build from the player mount. Where this build gets really interesting is that we've got Plasma Splash at tier 4. This gives that AoE damage for wherever that projectile is going to land, increasing the potential for its damage. And we can see in these examples, if we're shooting the target, we can get ricochet hits into other targets. So this is where we're starting to build that AoE picture, gaining that additional damage that the bouncing projectiles are giving you. But we can take this even a step further, if we actually shoot at the ground in front of our target, we're going to get the splash damage and then the projectile is going to bounce into the target, doubling down on the damage that we can get. Looking at some simulations with high value targets now, and we can see it's going to take more time and more ammo to take this acid spitter down. That's because we're losing that 5 damage on direct hit. I ended up running this simulation about 9 times because I just wasn't sure of the results, because I was so sure that impact deflection would take longer and consume more ammo. But after all of these tests, it's actually quicker and consumes less. The only thing I can think is the fact that that 5 fire damage from the splash damage is somehow affecting the tri jaw, even though we're not getting that splash area effect and that's why it's taking those 9.6 damages rather than the 7.5 on the tri jaw on the left. And against this menace we can see the time is mitigated because we can also get that splash damage and that double hits but it is still a greater ammo consumed. Looking at some more positive simulations for impact deflection and here we've got 8 grunts at 25 meters and we can really see that time saving and ammo saving compared to our overclocks which act more like the base gun. I wanted to see if range was going to make much of a difference and at 55 meters you can see it's going to consume more ammo with impact deflection because it's harder to get those bounces but it's still about the same as the ammo consumed even at our 25 meters on the left hand side. This same story is reflected with our slasher examples so again at 25 meters and then we will examine at 55 meters and it tells the same story. Basically at range it's going to be much harder to try and pinpoint where you want that deflection to land so that you get the splash and bounce into the target. Whereas with our other over clocks the range doesn't make so much of a difference because we're just trying to hit the target. Impact deflection can also double up for our single target larger threats. Being able to use that splash and then bounce into the target we can quickly take this Praetorian down. And even with less ammo consumed compared to our base gun overclocks. This is a solid build when it comes to your elite deep dives and hazard 5 but let's see how impact deflection holds up against our other overclocks. So we have a huge increase in damage and a lot of negatives. Let's start off with that accuracy and this first example flatters because on that left hand side I'd got used to running the extra projectile speed so I really mess up there but we can see it's comparable. But once we go to 40 meters this is night and day when we compare the difference between using our overclocks on the left hand side which is more like the base gun and using OPA on the right hand side. This simulation is comparing whether we take tier 3 accuracy or not and on that right hand side at 25 meters we can see the tier 3 accuracy really is bringing us in a little bit more damage, saving us a bit more time and ammo because we're hitting more often. And if we extend this now to 35 meters, you can see if you want to hit anything at this range, really you're going to need tier 3 accuracy mod and you're going to have to try and do it in small bursts to try and bring that accuracy back in. There are two main opinions when it comes to accuracy with OPA. The first is that tier 3 accuracy is essential and you have to take it. And the second one is that the accuracy is so poor that you might as well go with one of the other options because you really need to get so close and you're going to be wasting so many shots anyway. Perhaps looking at heat control in our next set of simulations will give us some extra data to help us decide. The extra heat draw on OPA can't be ignored and even at just 25 shots we can see we're almost overheating of OPA. And one of these reasons is because now if we run this as a magazine size we can see that actually it's only 30 shots that we've got in that magazine. So obviously at 25 we're almost overheating. Running our 25 shot simulation but with tier 1 heat shield on that right hand side and we can see the real difference this makes to our heat. This also equates to a magazine size of 40 
which is only 5 off our base gun with no heat mods. The player the Djinn has two builds, one which is all of the ones and this is a burst damage utilising manual heat dump to quickly get rid of that heat. The second build is utilising heat shield at tier 1 to give you a bit more room and a bit more sustainability. I also think there's that potential if you think that you're just going to get up close and not worry about that custom coil alignment at tier 3, then take hot feet instead, utilising that with manual heat dump so you can get in and out. Comparing rate of fire or heat shield at tier 1 and we can see that that burst damage on the left hand side, we can get that damage across very quickly under 2 seconds, but with the more sustained damage we can see we've done a lot more of a chunk of damage to that Praetorian on the right hand side. And actually as we progress through the simulation and get to the end, we kill the Praetorian quicker because we've got more sustainability and with the exact same ammo. Let's look at the Praetorian with impact deflection versus OPA and we can see it's pretty close, especially considering impact deflection starts with a lot more base ammo, but OPA does take down the target quicker and with less ammo consumed. OPA in horde simulation mode, so this is going up against our overclocks which are like the base gun and it absolutely annihilates them in time and in ammo saving. Of course this is at 25 meter range and not 55 meters where it's going to really struggle. Same simulation now but up against impact deflection and we can see that this one is actually far closer. Yes OPA kind of gets ahead on that time, it's going to save you a bit of time against the horde but that ammo difference is not a great deal. OPA is a lot of people's favourite, that massive amount of damage but I really question those negatives in the ammo, the accuracy and that heat gain for sustainability. Does it really compare against impact deflection or our next overclocks? Shield battery booster is an absolute beast to Deep Rock Galactic. It deals so much damage, that projectile speed, the rate of fire, it is absolutely crazy. It doesn't matter whether it's high value targets, large single targets, hordes, and it doesn't even really matter at any range also. If you can point at it, you can fire it, you're going to kill it with shield battery booster. It's absolutely crazy, but it's also absolutely ridiculous in a bad way. And this is because all of those bonuses, all of those craziness that it gives you, any kind of damage you take, as soon as your shields take the tiniest speck of damage, your overclock shuts off until you get to full shields again. So it's completely mitigating your entire overclock unless you have full shields. Now this makes certain biomes very risky with running this, it makes certain mission types really risky when doing this, black box salvage operations, but also friendly fire is going to shut down this overclock. Pheromone in the enemies might make them not hit you, but your teammates still will hit you, and even if you just take a little bit of full damage from a bad grapple, your overclock shuts down. I should also say if you overheat the gun, it collapses your shields and this is the same even if you use manual heat dump and that effectively turns the overclock off until your shields come back. This forces you into taking thermal feedback loop which is a little bit like playing with fire because it can help you overheat your gun. I really love the concept the developers were going with this, that risk to reward and if you play better you get more benefit but at the moment it just feels absolutely awful and it seems like bad design to then punish the player and turn your overclock off for x amount of seconds each time especially when it's silly damage like for fire. I really think this should have been based on the percentage of your shields. If you've got say 75% you get 75% of the boost. If you've got 50% you get 50% and so on. At the moment I think shield battery booster, as powerful as it is, should be avoided. I tested whether we could see this extra 5 fire damage over 50% heat and we can see against this brood nexus I'm dealing 6 damage but as soon as I go over that 50% heat I'm then dealing that additional damage taking us to 10 and we can even see this if I put the heat really high it's still doing 10 damage and I just wanted to confirm fire resist on target suppressors have high fire resist and we can see this here instead of going up from 6 damage to 10 we're only going up to a smaller amount. The additional time it takes to recover when you overheat is extremely painful and you really want to try and limit the amount of times that that happens. We generate additional heat per shot, but that's kind of a good thing with thermal exhaust feedback because it quickly gets us to that additional fire damage and this leads us nicely onto our potential builds. Who even has got a build here and I'm calling this the safe build. We've got both heat options and this is really to try and control that heat so we're in a better operating window. On the right hand side, another player suggested to me this burst variant. So this is going to be high risk. We're going to quickly get to that additional fire damage, but we're going to have to manage it and potentially manual heat dump. I also have a variation 
information on who evens build here and that's with taking projectile speed at tier one i do this personally because i find it easier to take on high value scout targets like webbers acid spitters and tri jaws especially at distance but that might just be me needing to get used to the slower projectile speed we can start to see the slight nuances in these different builds on that far left we're getting to that additional fire damage really quickly in less than a second with my build in the middle the high value target build it's the same amount of ammo but it is taking us a little bit longer and the safe build is taking us five additional ammo and a lot more time building to that 50 percent heat is only one half of the story though because now we need to manage it and now that safe build on the far right hand side really comes into its own to keep managing that gun with that extra damage i think all of these builds have their merit i personally like my one in the middle because it can do a bit of everything high value targets with an acid spitter now and we can see thermal exhaust feedback beats impact deflection which has been our best overclock so far on average and it beats it hands down and more high value targets here with impact deflection on the left and we're up against three tri jaws and you can see firma exhaust feedback absolutely annihilate impact deflection in this simulation in the amount of time it takes to take them down but also in that ammo saving i ran this simulation five more times until i got a grouped up one for the impact deflection to see if that splash damage would really help and even with the splash damage go fractions quicker but it is still more ammo consumed than firma exhaust feedback and to be thorough i put in our final high value target being a menace and we can still see that the timing isn't so much of an issue but firma exhaust feedback still takes it down with less ammo going over to our horde simulation now and we know opa beat out impact deflection at 25 meters so then we've put that up against firma exhaust feedback and we can see that for time tef wins and it's only three ammo more after using the drac solidly for free promotions speaking to all the other high level players getting their feedback and creating this video i think we land in this kind of position with firma exhaust feedback at the top impact deflection is a great choice also thermal liquid coolant that sustained firepower i didn't give it enough credit but it feels quite nice to use aggressive venting when you actually control it with manual heat dump and get that aoe fear on demand is really powerful to use overtuned particle accelerator i just couldn't get on with that lack of accuracy and not being able to take on those high value targets and then rewiring mod and shield battery booster cool concepts but i just think they're outclassed by the other overclocks on this list if you've made it this far thank you so much for watching be sure to check out my other scout series videos and there should be the link at the top right for your next video hopefully i'll see you next time